All right, we are going to hear from the word of the Lord from the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, and then chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Imati, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board and to go with him to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each one cried to his God, and they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. And Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down to the hold of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. The captain came down and said to him, What are you doing, sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God, your God, will, stare us, will spare us uh, as, so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, come, let us cast lots so that we may know who, on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What, what is your occupation? What, what do you, where do you come from? What is your country? And, and what people are you? And he said, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid, and they said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them so. Then he said to him, what shall we do for you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up, throw me in the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. And then they cried out to the Lord, please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. And the men feared the Lord even more. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim it the message that I told you. So Jonah set out after being regurgitated on the land by the great fish. Ew. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. And Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. And they proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. And when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today is a very special day in the life of the church. It is All Saints Day. It is the celebration uh, that we, uh, we hold very holy and, and special, uh, where we remember those who are dearly departed from us. And just as an opportunity to kind of give you this little housekeeping information, you received this little reserved card. If you notice, you can just fold it in half so it just says reserved, kind of like a place card at a table setting. Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you. And uh, those words of hope are words for us to cling to today as we remember uh, folks in our church who passed away since last All Saints Day, as well as members of our family uh, who we have missed for quite some time. And so this is an opportunity for you if you want to open it up on the inside and write a little note to them, how much you miss them, or if you want to write on the, the front or the back, of, depending how you look at it, their name or their names. So as you come forward for communion today, you can just set those down and then I'll just be gently placing them around the table to be reminded that although we cannot see them anymore, they have a much better seat than we do. <laughs> and so as a cause and a time for us to celebrate. So that's what we'll be doing today to mark this, uh, this sacred occasion, although it is tinged with a little bit of guilt. We are thankful that the main course is grace and joy. So that's All Saints Day. Now, All Saints Day kind of ties into this week because something that, 
none of us thought would happen before H-E double hockey sticks froze over was the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. And I feel robbed because both of my grandparents were huge, both my grandpas were huge baseball fans. In fact, my grandpa Dewey, wherever they went, he had this little tiny AM radio that he always had so he could listen to his, his favorite team. And I feel robbed because I could not share uh, the Chicago Cubs and their, their great comeback and this wonderful celebration in Chicago. I couldn't share that with my grandfathers because they've, they've both since died. I feel robbed. Because they were both Reds fans and I couldn't rub it in that the Cubs had... That the Cubs had won. So that was, that was tough. But I know they have a much better, much better seat where they're at. And they would both tell me, well, how, how many championships do the Cubs have? Uh, yeah. So it was, a good, it was a good week, and it's a good time for us to remember. And as we're into the story of Jonah, as we're going through some of these, these Hebrew scriptures, you know, I, I gotta be honest with you, the book of Jonah and the story, is, it's kind of hard to take sometimes. I don't get what the big deal is about Jonah, because, you know, it makes sense to me why he does what he does. I understand why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, and it was a massive city more than eight miles across. And it was the home of the goddess Ishtar, where people would come from miles around to receive healing by, by touching the base of her statue. So they followed a different god, an idol. They... Or they didn't worship a god at all. It sounds like real winners, I guess. There were poor in Nineveh, too. There were, there were poor people. But some of these poor people, very small fraction, they knew how to work the system. These poor people knew how to receive things when they were able to work without working. This is a small percentage. So all the poor began to be hated in Nineveh. Compassion for the whole diminished because of the hatred of a, of a few. But there were rich there were rich people in Nineveh. They climbed over one another because each one felt they were more entitled than the other to, to have more and to have more. The rich mostly climbed over the poor, though. Why? Because it was easy to justify because all the poor worked the system. There were some in Nineveh who thought that the walls should be round so that there would be no blind spots during a battle. They were sure that they were right. There were others, though, that believed that the walls should be straight and come to right angles to be fortified more strongly, and they, they were sure they were right. So they fought each other time and time again, and all the time that they could have spent making things stronger, they instead picked at one another and made their nation weaker. It was more important to be right than to be safe. See, they operated out of opinions, and as, as well, do you know what an opinion is? It's a belief or judgment that rests on grounds insufficient to produce complete certainty. An opinion is a belief or judgment that rests on grounds insufficient to produce complete certainty. That's why people fight for their opinions in Nineveh. They fight for them because they can't stand on their own. The Ninevites didn't value women either, except for what the women could provide. A woman couldn't even be, be bothered to be considered a widow in Nineveh, in Assyria. Until not just her husband had died, but all of his brothers were dead as well. You know, no wonder Jonah didn't want to go. He wanted nothing to do with these people. And see, God, what was God sending Jonah to do? Proclaim their judgment. He got to deliver the bad news, and he still didn't want to go. Why? Because he just wanted it to come out of nowhere and flatten them out. They don't even deserve to be warned that the end is coming. He didn't think they even deserved the proclamation of the judgment. So, you know, we look to our own time. What are the conflicts that we see? We see police protecting private land. We also see Native Americans who've been pushed off land for generations and see land as connected and a pipeline as a potential hazard. We see police going out every night, risking their lives, protecting our homes, our neighborhoods, our cities, our townships. But we also see black men gunned down in different ways where non-lethal means could have been used. We saw this week a man who was killed by, who killed police but was brought in with non-lethal means and he was white. We see people in heated debate over the next president and we've, we've taken this conversation that the American people need to hear and we've dragged it through the mud and it's unrecognizable. It's as though we're electing a monarch the way we treat this presidential race. That this person will have absolute power and authority over the American people. 
We see people so sure that they are right, they're alienating and tearing up relationships. We see in our nation, in our world, we see opinions as more valuable than credentials. We see science as discounted and opinion elevated. Opinion, which is a belief and judgment that rests on grounds insufficient to produce complete certainty. But see, the problem is with opinion is it's so fragile and it has to take so much energy to protect it that it never changes. It can't grow. It can't adapt. Opinion stays what it is. Opinion tells us not to listen to anything that is different or challenging. So our opinions on law enforcement, our opinion on, on crime or racial tension or native rights to land or private rights, anything that we can have an opinion on, we hold on tight, and that opinion becomes so inward-focused and so guarded that everything that we experience in life is seen through the lens of our opinions. So when we encounter someone, when we greet someone, when we see someone, when we hear about someone and what they've done or not done, our opinions see them as through this lens. And we believe that as fact, and we define that as who that person is. My opinions, they build, and they build, and they build, and I start to see others, perhaps in ways that they really aren't. And so I use my opinions, I use that lens to judge and evaluate others. And God says, I don't want your opinions. What could your opinions add to my knowledge? God's all-knowing. So what do I expect that my opinions could add to God's knowledge? God says, I want your obedience. You promised in proclaiming to, to follow me in your membership, in your baptism, in your heart. You promised your obedience, so I command you, love one another. John Wesley took it down a notch so we could actually understand how to live it out, and he, he put it this way in the three simple rules. Do no harm, do good, and keep working at your faith. And keep working at your faith includes uh, spending time in communion with one another, studying the scriptures, participating in Bible study, family prayer time, searching through the scriptures, celebrating sacraments of baptism and communion. Wesley even had advice for Christians who have a vote in the upcoming election, and he writes in his journal from the 1700s, I met those of our society who had votes in the ensuing election, and I advised them, number one, to vote without fear or reward for the person they judged most worthy, to vote for the person of the greater good rather than what it means for me personally. Second, to speak no evil of the person that they voted against, and third, to take care their spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. Love one another, Christ says. Wesley says, take care of your spirit that it's not sharpened against those who don't vote the way that you do. Who look maybe through a different lens. All right, so Jonah. So Jonah takes off and runs. Because he doesn't want to have anything to do with those wicked people. He doesn't even want to proclaim God's judgment. But God intervenes and Jonah relents and he goes. He goes to Nineveh, that great city. And he shares God's words. And the Ninevites listen, and they repent. And God is so moved that God does not destroy or harm a single hair on anyone's head. He spares the people. And see, Jonah has taken up a vantage point outside the city to watch the destruction. He has everything short of a, of a thing of popcorn to, uh, to enjoy the spectacle. He wants to see the death of what God tells us later in chapter 4 of 120,000 people. He's there sitting, excited to see them wiped off the map. Thinking, well, you know what? This was a good idea after all that I come here. All right. But when God doesn't kill him, Jonah's angry because his opinion is they don't deserve grace. His opinion is that they don't deserve mercy. His opinion is they don't deserve a second chance. They're not even followers of, of his God. And God says to Jonah, I don't need your opinions. What can your opinions do? What can your opinions add to my knowledge? I am making this choice because of how I see things. God is telling Jonah that he is blind. Now he can see that there's a shrub growing over him. He can see the city. He can see in the traditional sense. But he is blinded by looking through the lens of his opinion. God, God has said, you know, you're blind. You can't see. 
You can't see the power of grace and mercy and love. You see, we sit at the edge of the city with a great vantage point, with excitement in our hearts just to watch it burn. Who's in the city for you? Who are the people that you just get so riled up about? You just love to see them in that city when the fire rains down upon them. But see, that gets to be a slippery slope because I'm a Ninevite, and so are you. Because we have all made selfish choices that take away from God's dream being realized here on earth. God's love and God's dream being given out to all of humanity for a better place. But I'm Jonah, and you're Jonah. And as we live for Christ, we encounter people we do not like, we do not agree with, and what's God do? Go, go to them, love them. God calls us to stay in the city and to model what it means to live in obedience and to live apart from opinion. You see, when you live in obedience to God, you don't have to have a lens to, to look through. You trust God's vision and not your own. And you're still going to have opinions, but you understand that they're opinions. And you line everything up that you think or you believe against what? Love. And if it matches up, you move on with that opinion you share it with community. And sometimes those wonderful opinions can be grounded in faith. And they can make a tremendous positive impact in the world in which we live. God calls us to love. Not just one another. But everyone. What is God's command to us? To keep your opinions to yourself and live in obedience to law. So who are the Ninevites, then, in the greater scheme of things? Who are you tempted to enjoy witnessing their destruction? Who are the people that get you all riled up that it's difficult to bite your tongue or even be in their presence? Those might be the people God calls you to spend more time with. And when all is said and done after Tuesday, I'm sure you're going to feel like there are more Ninevites around you than before. <laughs> but that's okay. Don't lose faith. Most importantly, don't lose heart. Don't complain, as those are the people God is calling you to love. And since God calls you to love everyone, the odds are pretty high that's who it's going to be. Because for some reason, our lenses are focused on those that we don't like. Why do we spend so much energy as human beings on things that we don't like? What would happen if we spent a fraction on that, on things that we value and the things that we love and the things that are good and the things that are peaceful and the things that are gracious and loving and kind? What if we spent more of that uh, energy on kindness? What would our nation look like? So let us all keep our opinions to ourselves and remain obedient to love, to move away from opinion and to move into God's obedience and his command to love. And in that, we will live in a place far greater than America could ever be. And that is the very kingdom of God. It's the very kingdom of God, built on the love and the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who calls, no, who commands for us to love one another in the very sacrificial, extravagant way that he first loved us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit.